my name is Henry Anning. I'm the CEO of Resource Co's Energy Business and also a board director of Bioenergy Australia. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be chairing the session on industrial heat. Uh, we are going to lead off, uh, I'm going to provide a bit of background around industrial heat and a bit of context and framework for the session. And then we've got three fantastic guest speakers uh, to drill in a bit more detail of specific projects that, that they've worked on within their businesses. So um, I'll just share some, uh, some slides to frame the session. Um, again, throughout the session, please add questions to the chat function um in google meets and we will have an allocated time at the end for questions to all speakers uh during the presentations we will pass straight from speaker to speaker and then have a facilitated discussion at the end so please either write your questions down to add them in later or add them to the chat function as we go through So I presume everyone can see that. Can uh, Shahana or someone just give me a yes? Yes. Thank you. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm delighted to be chairing this session. And, and one of the reasons is that, uh, you know, I've been passionate uh, sort of advocate for renewable industrial heat for some time. Um, and one of the key reasons for that is highlighted in the graph of Australia's emissions profile. Uh, all of the policy focus, uh, well, 90% of the policy focus, investment and activity in renewable energy over the last uh, probably 10 years has been focused on electricity. Uh, and, you know, to the extent that, you know, the Renewable Energy Act and Renewable Energy Target, uh, the terms almost used interchangeably when those are obviously renewable electricity targets uh, and renewable electricity act. So uh, heat is, in some way becomes a bit of a forgotten energy. And I think uh, there's a there's a whole uh, range of potential activities and fantastic outcomes that bioenergy can achieve in the heat space. So I'll just touch on some of those as, as a bit of an introduction and then pass over to the, the detailed speakers. Um, Arena did some great work a couple of years ago. If you're interested in renewable heat and you haven't seen this report, I recommend it to you. It's available on the Arena website. Um, uh, there were, there were a couple of reports. There was a 2017 version and then a 2019 version. Uh, and some of the following slides have been extracted from uh, the outcomes of this report. And this was one of the, I think, the, the key findings or the key analysis was around the, the total final, final energy consumption in Australia. Um, and what you'll see here is that, you know, the, the largest single sector for consumption is industry and the largest single use of that energy within industry is for process heat. Uh, so again, obviously electricity and residential and rooftop solar gets a lot of the focus, but uh, it's very important to keep in mind where the energy is actually used and what it's used for. Within the process heat uh, sort of analysis, it obviously breaks it down into the source or the generation, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a couple of slides. Um, and then also the temperature profile and, and you know, there are different types of process heat, as I'm sure you're aware, and bioenergy absolutely has the potential to provide a significant proportion, uh, you know, at least 50% of the temperature ranges there that are identified as currently used by industry for process heat in Australia. So we may not have, uh, you know, residential district heating systems, uh, the way that uh, a lot of European countries do, and a lot of bioenergy is used for those uh, sort of residential district systems. But uh, to say Australia doesn't have heat demand is a nonsense. In terms of the types of industry, uh, again, this gives a breakdown. Some of the heavy industries, the iron and steel, oil and gas, alumina, uh, but also food and beverage, uh, which I think is a key focus for, uh, you know, for the use of renewable heat and biomass in Australia. Um, you know, cement lime products is also a key element there. You know, at Resource Co, we're a significant uh, suppliers of biomass-based uh, process engineered fuel to cement kilns to replace coal or natural gas. So it is already happening uh, and it's already happening in other sectors as well. In terms of what the fuel source is for that process heat, so this is just in a bit more detail of what was presented a couple of slides ago. So again, natural gas and black coal providing by far the majority. Uh, and as we know from both an emissions perspective and a cost perspective, those two energy sources have gone through huge changes uh, in cost over the last few years. 
um, and the increasing focus on emissions, I think, will only further uh, highlight the need for transition and replacement. Uh, big gas, uh, as you're probably aware, and, and I know uh, Matt uh, Walden touched on it in the opening session, already provides a significant amount of process heat and also base load electricity um, to, the, to the grid. Uh, so there are, is already a lot of bioenergy coming from big gas and wood waste wood as well. So I think as an industry, what we want to see is obviously those bits of the pie chart grow significantly. And that's effectively what the bioenergy roadmap showed uh, was that, you know, within the first theme, um, again, just drawing out a couple of points uh, in more detail of, of Matt's opening presentation or for those that missed it, uh, you know, the bioenergy roadmap, the first theme around hard to abate sectors, and within that section, uh, one of the three key focus areas being industrial renewable heat, hence the uh, the topic of uh, this session of this of the uh, workshop today. So within the bioenergy roadmap, there was, it was identified there was the potential for up to 244 petajoules per annum of renewable industrial heat, uh, around 33% of the total industrial heat market. So obviously a much bigger proportion of the pie chart uh, that we saw earlier. And looking at the more detailed modelling and the targeted deployment, which was the focus strategy of the three scenarios that were run in the bioenergy roadmap, uh, again, industrial heat there, the first point is already 108 uh, petajoules. Uh, so that's the first point to make. It's already a significant tr contributor, um, but also the growth potential, uh, you know, through to, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 and 50 uh, there, showing significant growth potential further in industrial heat. The other point that I think is really important is there's a footnote in the report saying the assumed cost of renewable industrial heat is $5.60 a gigajoule in 2030. Um, so again, compared to uh, gas and coal, um, I think a lot of parties would be very happy with that price. So the barriers in industrial heat, and I'm sure our speakers will touch on this to some extent, it's, it's not necessarily um, an economic barrier the way it may be or a technology development barrier in some other bioenergy sectors. Uh, you know, it's really a deployment, uh, a deployment barrier and having the, perhaps the policies in place to deliver enough projects to get the critical mass and the confidence to be, uh, you know, delivered to its full potential within the Australian market. So in terms of the speakers today, uh, again, we've got three great speakers providing case studies. Um, each of those speakers will pass on to the next and we'll have a 20 minute session at the end uh, for questions. As I said, and I'm just a reminder, please do put your questions uh, in the comments panel um, or keep them to out at the end. So uh, with that, I'll pass over to Nick uh, to deliver his case study. Thanks, Henry. <coughs> Appreciate that. I'll um, just make sure I select the right window. Share that. Um, Turn my camera on. So does that come through okay? Yep, all good. Excellent. Um, I'm just going to... Yep, that's good. So thanks. Welcome, um, everybody, to this this next session. Um, Nick Holmes, I'm uh, General Manager of Windsor Australia. I'm just going to give a, a couple of fairly high-level um, case studies of, of um, a couple of projects we've done recently. Um, so I'll start with just a quick intro to who wins or what we do, and then um, there's a 10 megawatt biomass boiler study and a conversion actually of a, of a larger boiler, um, converted it from coal to biomass. Um, unfortunately, these are the, the recent projects we've done are both in New Zealand. Um, we have got references here in Australia, but, but they're um, getting a bit older now, and I think they've been, uh, been displayed at these forums in the past, so these are a couple of new ones. Uh, so Windsor, um, the group has, has got a couple of divisions. Um, the engineering group started uh, many years ago, focused on uh, kilns, uh, timber drying kilns specifically. Um, so we've had a long presence in, in the timber industry. Obviously, a lot of um, biomass uh, waste is, is generated there. Um, they need a lot of energy in the kilns to, to dry the timber. Um, so more recently, the, the new... Business Silo, the energy group, um, it was in a, under a former um, different name that, that was rolled into the, the Windsor team probably about three years ago now. Um, so we're, we're a mid-sized business, a couple of hundred people, uh, predominantly New Zealand uh, engineering base with, with project management and some manufacturing here in, in Australia. So of relevance to this forum, um, the energy team um, I guess historically, we've done a lot of coal boilers, gas-fired boilers. 
Um, and in the last 10, 10 to 15 years, there's been a, a much uh, stronger focus on biomass. Um, so we've got a range of, of products that, that, that's within our portfolio. Uh, traditionally, sort of package boilers are, are um, natural gas fired, um, but now there's options to, to utilize those existing boilers and, and retrofit on um, pelletized burners. So you can see there in, in the second photo, we have this technology um, for, for pulverized pellets to burn in sort of smaller furnaces. Um, we're certainly seeing a, a change towards electric boilers um, in New Zealand where there's limited uh, options for, for, for new plant. Uh, natural gas is, is no longer an easy option. Um, coal is certainly a thing of the past. So biomass and, and electric uh, generation are, are certainly the way forward. Um, we've got several different technologies we can offer for, for biomass, depending on what, what the application is, what the fuel is, the, the moisture content of the fuel is, is a big driver um, and, and, and the calorie value of the fuel. Um, in terms of the electrical boilers, we're also looking at um, thermal storage. Uh, so we've got a, a partner in, in Europe that has um, energy nest thermal storage. So it's using um, large large uh, inertia, I suppose, with, with, with um, the ability to store heat in, in that thermal mass. So you can charge them up with, with low cost electricity during the day, especially here in Australia with, with um, almost negative electric charges during the day, um, store up a thermal inertia during the day and, and discharge at night for, for the process, whether that's a steam or, or thermal oil through a heat exchanger. Um, we've also got a range of indirect air heaters that are used a lot in, in the dairy industry and, and looking at biomass options of those is, is uh, the way we're going. Um, and fuel conversions, we're um, starting to see more of the old coal boilers being converted to, to uh, biomass. So that's a quick overview of what we do. Um, so we've got two, two case studies. The first one is a sawmill called uh, Red Stag. It's the largest um, sawmill in New Zealand. Um, it, produces, it processes about a, a million tonnes per year of, of log, um, predominantly um, structural timber that is what it produces. Um, so that's a bit of a messy photograph, but it just provides an overview of the scale of the plant. Um, there's a couple of existing boilers down to the right of the photo and on a smaller one that we installed, um, squeezed in the center there. Um, you can see the kilns in, in the sort of foreground there that uh, utilize most of the process heat um, to, to dry the timber from the saw, saw lum, lum, lumber. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so a mill of this sort of size has a huge, huge demand in, in power, um, both electric to, to drive all the, all the motors, the drives around the plant, um, as well as the thermal load that goes into the kilns to a uh, steam to, to um, heat up the air to dry, dry the timber. So I guess they, they have the perfect scenario. They generate a waste product, um, the, the, the sawdust and the shavings. Um, and they have a huge uh, thermal demand, and typically they, they do balance out. Um, in this site, they did have uh, an excess of very wet fuel, um, so their existing boilers couldn't couldn't burn that fuel. Um, so that was one of the drivers here to to utilise a new boiler that would burn sixty percent moisture fuel. Um, so that's that's incredibly wet, um, and the excess steam that that produced could then go into a turbine, and, and there's a bit of cogeneration on site as well. Um, so what we offered, the, um, the overview, um, there's a bit of technical summary on the right, but essentially it was a, a 10 megawatt boiler. So the products we offer, that's, that's sort of the smaller end of the spectrum. Um, we offer, we're, we're agents for a licensee for Babcock and Wilcox boiler technology. They're one of the oldest boiler providers out of the States originally. Um, so it was a 10 megawatt thermal, so 13. 13 tons per hour of, of superheated steam that it generated. Um, so the idea here with, with um, the excess steam, if we generated the steam at a high pressure, um, it could then be let down through a steam turbine, um, which would reduce the steam in pressure, um, generate electricity in the process of, of reducing the pressure. Um, and then the lower grade 10 to 12 bar steam would then go to the process to, um, to go to the kilns. Um, the scope of the supply was, was a turnkey um, 
what we call a boiler island. So everything to do with the, the boiler and, and the, the associated equipment to um, to drive it, um, the fuel, fuel conveyor system into the boiler um, and the piping into the process. So this one was actually um, 42 bar was, was the operating pressure. That's, that's relatively high for, for a small boiler like this. Um, and it had a superheater that, that just helps get more efficiency uh, when you put it into a turbine. This is um, a typical cross section of, of what a, a tower pack boiler looks like. Um, so the benefits of or the design features probably of this style of boiler is the obvious one. It's a very tall furnace. Um, the key to, to a good boiler is, is getting good combustion, um, burning out your fuel completely. Um, and the, the three parameters that, that allow that are time, temperature and turbulence. So you have a long residence time in the boiler. Um, it's very important to have lots of over fire air to, to get the turbulence. Um, and the temperature is, is the combustion temperature, getting that as high as you can um, before you run into potential sort of fouling problems with, with clinker. Um, some of the benefits of this style of boiler is the simplicity. Um, it, it doesn't rely on a, a step grate, which, which a lot of um, European sort of style boilers use. They, they tend to have a sort of high wear. So there's some benefits of a simple, simple grate, a vibrating grate. Um, we use water cooled tiles on that grate so the tiles can, can be replaced. Um, and again, uh, the, this style of water cooled furnace needs minimum refractory. Um, again, refractory is typically used to, to encompass the, the firebox and, and keep the heat in, um, but it becomes over time a, a, an expensive item to, to maintain. Um, one of the other features of this style of, of grate is, is um, it's got a spreader stoker, so the fuel is, is uh, spread onto the grate. A lot of it burns in suspension, um, so it's a fast reacting boiler. Um, so if you've got a load swing or a load profile that's that, that's changing quite a lot, this this boiler will follow that uh, follow that load swing um, very quickly. There's no big inertia of fuel that that sits on the grate. Um, one of the big drivers here was uh, was allowing the the boiler to to burn the very high uh, moisture content fuel. I think the other boilers on site were struggling. One was designed specifically just to burn bark. Um, so this this had um, some some additional features to preheat the combustion air to quite a high temperature to to allow that um, that fuel to be burnt. Um, this is um, a three D model of what was produced, um, what we what we delivered. Uh, it just allows um, a bit of an explanation of of what the key components are. So there's, a, there's a fuel storage. This is, it's, it's not the full fuel storage, it's just a day bin. Um, so it allows um, maybe um, a few hours of, of storage close to the boiler. The fuel's dropped down into the, the grate, which is the bottom of this, this boiler component. So this is the actual main heart of the boiler. Uh, it's a steam drum and water drum. Um, the flue gases, once they pass out of the boiler, go through an economizer to, to further reduce the flue temperature uh, for better efficiency. Um, and then there's a big component of, of flue gas cleaning, which is um, getting the particulate emissions down to, to an acceptable level before they go through the ID fan and, and up the stack. Um, so that, they're the sort of key components. Obviously, um, combustion air is, is, is a big component. So you have a four draft fan, which goes through a big preheater to, to elevate the temperatures before they get into the furnace. Um, this design has a lot of layers of over fire air to, to get all that turbulence into the furnace, just like blowing your fire when, when it's time to go out, it, it, it ignites, it gets the oxygen into the fire and, and um, stirs it up. Um, so that's the idea with, with the over fire air. Um, one of the benefits of, of our systems is, is um, there's a lot of galleries that, that go to all the areas that have equipment that, that may need servicing and maintaining over long periods of time. Um, so it may look uh, quite a quite a busy site. It, it really just allows that that um, that maintenance aspect to be well managed over long periods of time. Um, this was quite a difficult site in terms of it was squeezing it in between existing boilers, buildings, conveyors. Um, 
just demonstrates this photo that we had to lift the boiler. It's not actually swinging on a pendulum. It's two cranes that are lifting the boiler up in the in the background there. Um, big lift uh, to, to get it over that existing conveyor system and, and squeeze it into um, the, the new footprint. Um, so again, site construction is very expensive, certainly in Australia. Keeping um, keeping equipment in in large modules is is uh, very beneficial. Um, again, we, you can see we had to construct starting at the back of the site with the stack and the and the galleries going into place first, then the economizer, and then the, the big lift and the boiler going in at the back. It's a bit of an overview, um, bird's eye shot uh, of, of the boiler there. Um, you can see in this left photograph the, the existing boilers in the background there. Um, the fuel conveyor came across from, from that existing plant into our day bin. Um, and a very, very, very tight site um, to work on. So less than ideal, um, quite a challenge to, to build it in such a, a small constraint. Um, but overall, um, yeah, a very, um, very successful project. Um, anything to of significance that we learned through this one probably we took on a commitment with very high moisture fuel um, the boiler has, has accommodated that very well um, but we did um, we did learn that uh, the emission control system um, was right at its limits we, we tried to well, we did get away with a with a cyclone system a multi-cyclone um, I think next time around we would we would probably have to go to a, an ESP or a more sophisticated baghouse to to get those emission levels um, a little bit lower. Certainly Australia has uh, probably lower limits than, than, um, than this site had. Uh, so the next uh, case study is um, a 43 megawatt coal boiler conversion. So it was a, it was an old boiler. I say old, it was probably 10, 10 or 15 years old. Um, it was one that Windsor supplied um, to Fonterra. So it was originally a, a coal boiler. They um, they have a lot of, or had a lot of lignite cheap coal um, for, for thermal generation. Um, Fonterra is obviously a, a very large dairy um, milk producer in New Zealand. Um, they've got a um, I think up to about 30 spray dryers across New Zealand. So they're, they're obviously a, a major player, but a lot of boilers in their portfolio. Um, a lot of their older boilers are coal. Um, Fonterra have obviously got some commitments to, to lower their emissions. Um, so 30% reduction within the next 10 years or, or nine years now. Um, obviously they've committed no more new coal boilers um, and phase out coal by um, 2037 to get to the, the net zero. Um, so this one particular project, a 43 megawatt boiler would, would give a 98% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So a massive reduction to, um, to, to tick off this one boiler. Um, There's some other drivers there at the same time, this uh, emission system on this boiler was, was getting tired. Um, so that was another driver that, that, that helped get this over the line, um, as well as um, some funding through um, the EECA um, technology demonstration fund in New Zealand. Um, some of the other benefits of, of what we did, um, overall improved efficiency, um, reduced sulfur emissions, obviously re removing that coal. Um, and with that, the, the ash that, um, that's inevitable with, with that um, high ash coal. Um, so that's, that's no longer a problem. So the, the fuel available is, um, is pellets that are produced by a company called Nature's Flame. Um, they manufacture their um, pellets using geothermal energy. Um, so it's, again, it's a, it's a, a, a carbon neutral um, product. Um, massive reduction in, in um, truck movements onto the site. Um, so the big differences between the coal and, and Pellets are um, the moisture content. Um, wood pellets are a lot drier. They have significantly lower ash. Um, their caloric value is a little bit uh, lower, so so that it does um, need to be offset with slightly higher um, tonnage rates. Um, but obviously, um, a far far better fuel to use. One of the downsides is um, it's hydroscopic, so it does absorb moisture. So you have to you have to protect your fuel, keep it dry. 
um, otherwise it, um, it, it'll quickly soak up water. Um, but there's some, some real benefits in, in using a, um, a very homogeneous, uh, consistent fuel. So in terms of what had to be done to, to modify a boiler, uh, the boiler was a tower pack boiler, so uh, similar to, to the, um, the previous one, the Red Stag. Um, so the actual boiler pressure pots themselves were, were very similar. Um, we initially carried out performance modeling just to understand what, what needed to be done. Um, it's quite a different fuel, quite a different combustion characteristics. Um, and it did show that if we just did a straight sw fuel swap, that you'd probably only get about 80% out of that boiler compared to its nameplate rating. Um, so there are quite a few aspects that need to be addressed. The bottlenecks were predominantly around the, the fan capacity, um, the, the ratio of combustion air and overfire air, how you control that. Um, the amount of air is higher, so the, the cleanup system needs to be addressed in terms of a larger baghouse, um, additional um, pre-separation. Um, I think there were also some other elements around the grate and the economizer that were coming to the end of end of life. So, so that sort of rolled into the project. Um, different fuel transport uh, and reception. Um, so we could utilize the existing equipment in principle with, with some, some upgrades. Um, and the ash system is quite different, uh, significantly less ash um, and, and different uh, characteristics of, of how it's managed. So this was the existing plant, um, just to give you a sort of overview of what the different components are. So to the left is, is the fuel conveyor, conveyor as it comes in, crosses over um, and is then stored in a surge bin. Um, which is again, some people call it a day bin, just a, a small local storage. Uh, the boiler itself is, is, is the main vertical pressure part. Um, the three silos in the front were the, the old bag house um, and the silo to the right, number six, is the ash storage. So it's quite a, quite a significant size of storage in, in that old plant. Uh, these are a few of the sort of finished photos and, and um, in, in middle of uh, installation. So the existing fuel delivery system was, was just a, a grizzly in the floor, so as you can see down here. So essentially the floor system is retained, um, but we've built a, a significant enclosure around that. So it um, keeps the weather out when the, when the trucks are tipping and, and uh, dumping the fuel. So with six or seven trucks per day, um, obviously that's the uh, logistics of bringing those in and out, um, having to roll the doors, keep the weather out is, is significant. Um, the conveyor system needed significant upgrades. Um, one of the issues with with the um, change in fuel is, is it is lighter and it has a tendency to, to produce quite a lot of dust. Um, so the conveyor system is needed to accommodate that. Um, the ash system was quite different, um, significantly less ash. So um, yeah, we can see the, the new system here was, was three, um, three skips that, that were enclosed rather than a significantly uh, larger silo. Um, again, this is the boiler sort of with the, some of the auxiliaries removed. Um, that's actually the economizer lifted out to, to be replaced. About two minutes, Nick, if that's all right. Yep, last slide. So here we go. Um, so in summary, uh, we, we managed to convert the boiler from coal to, to biomass, uh, achieving 100% MCR. We did actually manage to lift the, the uh, performance slightly from where it was because it was constrained with some of the older, older assets. Um, a, few, a few key points to understand is, is really, understand, if you're going to convert, is understand how good a condition your boiler is in. Um, until you pull it apart, you, you can be confronted with some surprises of how poor condition some, some bits of equipment are in. Um, dust was a big, not a big issue, but a, but a big um, new addition that we maybe underestimated at the, at the early trial stage. It didn't, didn't demonstrate how much ass was going to, sorry, um, dust was going to uh, accumulate. Um, so yeah, if you're going to do some trials, make, make good use and, and maximize your time there. Um, so, yeah, that's me for today. Thanks for your time. Um, and I'll be passing on to Dominic Murphy, um, who's going to talk about the um, Meredith Dairy. So over to you, Dominic. Thanks, Nick. 
Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Ooh. Uh, yep. Oops. Well, actually, let me share. Nick was sharing. He's just stopped. So maybe try oh, again. Yeah, try again. Nope. It's coming up now. Okay. Can you see the my slide? Yes, we can. And okay, great. I'll kick off. Thank you. Uh, so my name's Don Murphy. Uh, I'm an environmental coordinator at Meredith Dairy. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about the operation here. So for those that aren't familiar with Meredith Dairy, uh, it's a family owned business. It's been operating for about 30 years um, and it's in Victoria. It's just west of the town of Meredith. Um, so it's a, it's a pr pretty sort of traditional uh, operation in that there's livestock and cropping and um, a lot of the operation is probably not too dissimilar from most um, sort of farm op operations around here. What sets it apart is is the type of dairy that it is. Uh, so there's several sort of goat dairies um, which are operated under uh, directly owned, operated by the owners or under a share farm arrangement um, and one sheep dairy. Um, and all of that milk is processed on site into um, cheese and yogurt products. Um, and over time, uh, even in the time I've been here, uh, just year on year, there's there's additional growth. So um, a lot of the a lot of the systems in place were sort of designed for a certain size operation, um, and the business just grows year on year. So something uh, is added to, um, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. Um, and there's a real sustainability focus from, from the owners. Um, and there are two environmental coordinators, myself and a colleague, um, who sort of essentially want to reduce the environmental impact of the business. So that's a, a large driver of our sort of taking our direction down the bioenergy path. Uh, but there's there are a lot of benefits um, around that as well. Um, so the, the property is about 1800 hectares and a, a couple of hundred or more hectares of that is set aside for um, biodiversity uh, tree planting and things. Um, and oh, sorry. And uh, th there's a lot of um, there's a focus to try and continue the operation, but reduce our emissions to zero. So to give you a bit of a feel for the sort of energy that we use, uh, so electricity at the factory site. Um, I did a similar presentation to this last year. Um, and last year we were talking about sort of about two and a half megawatt hours per day of electricity and, and that's increased just with growth to three megawatt hours per day. Um, and heat, last year we were um, maybe 10 to 13 gigajoules and just we've brought a lot of additional production online uh, to meet demand um, and we're also doing things like uh, improved cleaning systems and we're now um, processing waste away from cheese production um, which which adds a significant heat demand so i think last year i was hoping at this time that we would uh, implement our planned improvements and we would wean ourselves entirely off gas um, we're not quite there but we're we're, we're getting a lot more heat from, from wood and and we still have aspirations to to get rid of gas entirely so today we, we use about um, 21, 22 gigajoules per day, which I've um, convert, I've just provided a, a six megawatt hours sort of equivalent um, to just give you an idea that the real energy user on site is is heat, not electricity. Um, significantly more heat is is used, and that's used in two circuits. One is for a system that we call the ring main, uh, which is for pasteurising, incubating yogurt. Um, thermalizing so essentially pasteurizing way again um, and and cleaning um, and that water is actually retained so we heat it draw heat off it and then reheat it um, but the, the water 
uh, doesn't change. And then we have another circuit, which is for actually washing things. So that goes down the drain every day and, and goes out to our settling ponds to to um, sort of be processed. Uh, and that is a lower degree circuit. And we call that the domestic hot water circuit. Um, at our other sites, which are the other dairies and our distribution centre, we, we have mainly an electricity demand. Um, and just like any sort of operation, we'd have pumps, equipment, refrigeration. Um, so about seven years ago, uh, the owners installed a boiler, a wood-fired boiler. Um, and last year, it ran continuously, but we were, we were outputting about 150 kilowatts continuous from a 240 kilowatt boiler. Um, we now run that at or, or in many cases above capacity, um, 24 hours a day at, at close to full capacity. Um, what that does is heats a tank, uh, heats two tanks for us, um, 34,000 litre buffer tanks. Um, and the, folk, the, the idea behind that is that we have peaks um, in our demand and then we have a, a very uh, long sort of downtime overnight. And by having those buffer tanks, it allows us to have a smaller boiler um, operating at a pretty consistent temperature and that, um, you know, it's a thermal battery, so it allows us to build up that heat over those down times. Um, the boiler was installed, uh, was supplied by a, a um, Polish manufacturer and installed by a company called Dragon Energy in Australia and we feed it with wood chips. So the wood chips we currently feed are 13%, sometimes up to about 25% moisture content. Uh, we currently use recycled pine chips, 25 millimetres um, screened chips. We do have ability to chip on site um, with the chipper and trucks here. The, the reason that we try to focus on recycled chips is that they're very cheap, they're very dry, and uh, just in terms of the, the logistics of, of chipping, it is actually easier to get chips delivered. Um, so that's our focus there. And we use probably about two tonnes per day. We have LPG boilers um, that are there that remain, um, they're installed uh, around the same time as the boiler and they remain there as, um, as a backup in case we have to do maintenance or to top us up when our demand exceeds what the boiler can provide. Um, so in terms of our domestic hot water circuit, um, we already have all of our roof is filled with either solar PV um, for electricity or solar evacuated tubes for hot water. Um, and we heat, we reclaim heat. So uh, dairy and manufacturing of cheese has a lot of heat exchange, so a lot of cooling, a lot of heating. Um, and as much as is practical, practicable, we will try to um, reclaim heat or, or transfer heat between different bodies of water or milk. Um, and with all of those sort of steps in place, um, we still use, last year we were using between 15 and uh, 25,000 litres per day. Um, and now we would consistently be using 25,000 litres a day of hot water at 60 degrees. Um, but one way that we've sort of increased our uh, reliance on wood chips rather than LPG is we've installed a couple of tanks. One is 12,000 litres that we will heat up overnight to 85 degrees and then we'll temper it with cold water out to 60 degrees, which essentially means that 20,000 odd litres um, of, of water at 60 degrees um, is preheated overnight and we don't have to, um, you know, make up that demand during the daytime, which is our bu busiest period. Um, and then we've added an, an extra 12,000 litres to it to our um, other buffer tank. So we've done a lot of work to increase efficiency and minimise losses. Uh, we've in increased our storage um, and we're doing some more work to reclaim some more heat and install install our um, actual capacity. So our capacity to, to um, burn more chips through through expansions on our current plant. So I'll um, talk about that more, more in a moment. Um, so to give you an idea of the costs of, our, of how we how we operate, um, up the top, uh, Henry spoke about $5.60 per gigajoule, um, which isn't far off what we sort of worked out here. So 
even considering the efficiency of getting um, heat into water from wood chips, so, so taking into account all the losses along the way, um, we, can, we can get a gigajoule of heat into water for $7.60 um, from wood chips. And that equivalent amount of energy costs us $23 from LPG. So it's a significant difference. Um, last year, so these are last year's figures, we were sourcing about 70% of our total energy from wood chips. And the reason that we were only able to um, provide 70% of the energy was purely just because of when we used that energy. So we would have huge demand through the day. And you can see from this graph down the bottom here, we've got um, the darker line is our demand on our circuit and the lighter blue line is um, the supply from the wood-fired boiler. So there would just be periods of the day where our demand would outstrip our supply. Um, and unfortunately, we, we then would have to have LPG kicking in to make sure that we could continue production. Um, but that 70% of heat that came from wood chips was actually costing us less than the remaining 30% that we got from LPG. Um, so over on the right, I've said if 100%. So at that time, the determination was made that if we could figure out a way to uh, get all of our heat from wood chips, it would cost us $36,000 a year. And if we decided to turn the wood-fired boiler off and, and rely purely on LPG, it would cost us nearly 110,000 a year. So a significant saving there, and there was a real focus to try and uh, shift towards wood chips and try and figure out ways where we could get our, our boiler to run as efficiently as possible and run for as long as possible. Um, so you'll see another thing on the line here, a graph. So this is over a 24 hour period. You'll see a very, uh, essentially no demand and no heat from the boiler um, first thing in the morning until production starts and then it tapers off overnight. And that sort of signaled that our buffer tank um, was was uh, recovered. There was The system was completely heated and we had no um, ability to put heat anywhere. So the boiler had to dial itself down. So what we undertook was a process of saying, well, how can we shift that load to essentially um, create a, a thermal battery? And that's where we are in, in 2021. So what we did, uh, I mentioned before about installing additional uh, tanks. So now we preheat our hot water overnight. Uh, we we preheat our buffer tank, um, which has now also increased capacity. Um, and we run our boiler much better. We clean it more often. Uh, we make sure that our chips are dry and clean much more diligently, I suppose, than we did um, two years ago. And as a result of that, we have a significant amount um, of the time our energy demand is met by wood chips. Um, and the boiler just runs 24-7, never really has a break. Um, but I also mentioned that production has increased. So although the costs are the same um, in terms of per gigajoule delivered, um, and we're getting a larger percentage, so um, at, oh, sorry, of our increased demand, we're now um, producing 85% of that from wood chips, um, and that's costing us $50,000. And here we are again trying to get everything from wood chips, um, if we could get it all from wood chips, it would cost us nearly 60000 to meet that increased demand. Um, and if we decided to turn it off, it would cost us just over $180,000 um, to source it from LPG. So you can really see that the bigger we get, the more the, more the spend is. Um, you know, there's, there's what, $120,000 a year that we save off wood chips. So it's, it's, it covers wages, it covers the... Um, you know the, the machinery and the, and the time spent keeping an eye on the boiler, which is which is very minimal um, compared to the saving. Um, in addition to the fact that it is a sustainable source, um, so whether we continue sourcing recycled chips or whether we sort of move towards um, chipping on site in future, um, particularly you know that that ties in with potential aspirations around. Um, forestry on the site um, with with native logging 
um, native forest logging ceasing in 2030. Um, th there's definitely a benefit there for it. Um, so th the other thing is um, electricity. So um, Henry also mentioned around electricity and sort of how that ties in with heat. So we do still have a significant um, electricity demand, but nowhere sort of near what how it compares to um, our heat demand. Uh, so we've done things like installing solar evacuated tubes for our, our um, heating of hot water that is done with electricity and solar PV and efficient lighting. Um, but probably we're at the stage where a lot of companies uh, probably are, where they have tried to reduce what they use, but looking at what they can sort of do, what the next steps are. Um, so this is an idea of what our electricity demand is. Um, you can see we have a pretty consistent base load of about 70 kilowatts electrical um, and sort of variation throughout the year, peaks through the daytime um, and increases in the warmer months. So yes, there is some scope there to um, install solar PV and battery storage, but I guess given that we're already down the bioenergy path and we have the infrastructure and probably a little bit less daunted about the um, the prospect of undertaking a, a sort of a relatively novel approach to to generating energy on site. Um, we're really interested in combined heat and power um, options. Um, <clears throat> the traditional sort of technology that gets recommended with dairy is quite offer quite often anaerobic digestion um, that doesn't really suit our operation in a lot of ways mainly because of the way the animals are sort of out on pasture or housed um, and and the quality of the manure um, so we are planning to um, do a combination of more solar pv and wood biomass combined heat and power um, so this graph here um, to give you an idea so the, in the right hand top corner that's our um, I guess our interval data so how much energy we use in a half an hour period over two years um, and it's consistent um, there are huge periods in there where either the sun's not out or there's very low solar radiance so solar and batteries in isolation is not really a solution for us um, and when that's coupled with our large heat demand or our existing um, shortfall in heat demand, um, it makes perfect sense to install a combined heat and power system, um, which will give us consistent year-round base load. It'll give us our extra heat capacity um, and it'll also help us move towards self-sufficiency. Self so we don't know what energy prices are going to do sort of coming into the future, particularly around heat. Um, and liquid fuels. Um, so this is one way that we can sort of safeguard that and, and make sure that we're as self-sufficient sufficient as possible. Um, yeah, and down the bottom, I've, I've just got, I guess, um, if we were to install a, a 60 kilowatt electrical um, combined heat and power generator, um, we essentially, um, the green is our, is our self-generated um, electricity. Um, and it's more than this year's graph. We've, we've done a pretty detailed analysis and, and we'll, we'll be um, early next year installing a combined heat and power system. Um, and at that point, we'll be uh, entirely self-sufficient for, for heat and largely self-sufficient for electricity. Um, just quickly on our other sites, uh, it's it sort of doesn't make a lot of sense to install, you know, complex... Um, bioenergy systems at a lot of our other sites because they're much smaller. Um, so we're doing things like um, there are a few oil burners. So we have waste oil. If anybody's familiar with the um, Meredith Dairy marinated product, there's a, it's a, a vegetable oil which has a high calorific value. Um, so we're going down the pathway of heating our oil, which is a significant um, energy demand at those sites from from that waste from the, from the factory. Um, and, and some clever things around heat reclaim, which is is really just, it makes sense um, to do sort of as, as some of the initial stages without even going down the bioenergy path um, and sort of stage heating. So reclaiming low grade heat and using that to preheat and then and then just using electricity or, 
or burners or whatever for that final um, stage of heating. Um, and yeah, that's just quickly on some of the other stuff we do. So um, I guess one of the things that we, we want to do is is um, not just, just burn wood, but make sure that the sort of net um, change in atmospheric carbon um, is, is beneficial, um, that we're actually reducing carbon from the atmosphere. So there's a significant tree planting program and uh, this sort of wood chips burning ties in with a lot of recycling that we're doing on the site. And yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Dom. Appreciate it. Uh, hand over now to Dylan. Oh, sorry. Yes, can I um, hand over to the CEO of Clean Care, uh, Dylan Gower? Can everyone see that? Yep, we've got it, Dylan. Okay. Hi, everyone. As I said, um, I'm representing Clean Core Development and also Clean Cara. Uh, I'm a director of Clean Core Development. Uh, we're part of the Clean Group, developing a project in Cara, New South Wales. And this presents a slightly different perspective because it um, it uh, deals with a number of different industries in collaboration. So just we'll run through a bit about the project and the process that we've undertaken to get it to where it is now. We can't see so you. This Dylan. Is around Sorry, oh, sorry, Dylan, not sure if you want your video on and off, but uh, we can't, or well, at least I can't see you at the moment. Okay, that's right. Just run with the presentation. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Can you see it now? Yep. Thanks. Yep. Um, so this is about developing an agri-industry precinct. So it takes into consideration a number of um, parties involved in this, uh, the council through their wastewater treatment plant, a number of other industrial parties that are all co-located within this agri-industry precinct. And where we effectively come into it is to provide an interconnection and services connection to those multiple facilities, either through um, site connections to the specific uh, services, uh, a biodiversity facility, which we are developing, and then a number of utilities and services provided from that, from that component and then distributed through local networks such as a microgrid. And then also looking and exploring uh, alternative structures around ownership and, and investment. So in terms of CARA, um, a number of key industry parties involved in the food and beverage sector and meat processing, also in non-metallic metals and, and, um, and fibres, and then also secondary steel and fabricated metals, and then obviously typical in an agricultural setting, uh, horticulture, greenhouses and the like, all co-located co within a close proximity to the facility. Uh, for In a regional setting, uh, these small to medium-sized industrial facilities are relatively small, but aggregated actually presents quite a significant demand. And that's where we're looking to respond to the sort of price margin is around for natural gas, uh, for most components is sitting around 20, dollars a gigajoule and then electricity at a $56 a gigajoule equivalent roughly 200 megawatts an hour. So where we're trying to respond to is that specific demand and, and that price point for those customers. Uh, in terms of the um, available resource uh, from a once again an agricultural setting did some analysis on the available uh, waste streams predominantly from uh, farm production as you can see, prior to even leaving Farmgate, there's significant loss uh, in production up to about 27% uh, just before it even gets to the wholesale or distributors. And then as you cascade down the, the food chain, uh, significant losses and availability of resource. And as you can see, you get to the bottom that you almost only have 33% of food producers actually eaten by consumers. So uh, a great opportunity and specifically from a regional perspective, looking at that top section around uh, farm waste. In terms of uh, business as usual for these industrial parties, uh, we've done a number of analysis in terms of their input requirements, in terms of electricity, obviously uh, generation, heating and cooling, and then specifically around the waste outputs in terms of what readily available resources there are coming from those waste outputs. A number of the parties themselves, uh, the, the, the participants in the project are actually waste producers as well. 
And then stemming from that, uh, doing some assessment on the actual emissions coming from those individual parties and how that aggregates over a significant amount just for a setting like Cara. So as part of the process, we've undertaken quite a detailed analysis, obviously uh, more broadly across each of the industries and each of the sectors, uh, looking at it from a, uh, an environmental perspective, but also from an energy and infrastructure perspective. And then more broadly, looking at some of the non-physical engagements with community, local government, and establishing a model that meets those requirements. How we're trying to review it, that we can offer by reviewing some of the supply chains, both upstream and downstream, and scoping some of the emissions uh, coming out of the processes, uh, that we can look to actually achieve a more circular approach to what, how we're how we, um, achieving an outcome, both from the recovery of those bioresources, the production and generation of renewable energy sources, both thermal and electrical, but also renewable fuels and fertilizers, and then how that's distributed in a localized model and then responding to the key uh, industry requirements individually. <clears throat> so two of the um, specific um, technologies that we've been exploring for the project are both um, uh, anaerobic digestion and also uh, thermal recovery or pyrolysis, as it's known. Interesting enough, um, there was a bit of talk earlier about pyrolysis. Um, our early interrogation identified uh, woody waste as a low-hanging fruit, particularly in regional settings. Uh, EPA some t years back put a moratorium on council um, min municipal green waste, uh, which meant they could no longer distribute it through um, through community or back to community. So there's a real opportunity there, but unfortunately, um, no technology providers as yet have sort of met the stringent New South Wales guidelines around uh, the emissions component. So that's sort of a, a real opportunity, but um, hopefully in the next um, short while, we'll be able to see some of these implemented there. Obviously, anaerobic digestion, a more t proven technology, widely utilised and wide widely known, and highly more suited to the more wet and more uh, non-cellulosic um, applications. In terms of generation, um, looking at sort of more broadly across the project, we've identified sort of two key components in terms of the project itself. Um, CHP, so obviously the utilisation of the biogas uh, produced from the anaerobic digestion, and then also the identified woody waste uh, through thermal boilers and utilization for heat and power. Um, looking more broadly in the future, looking at thermal refrigeration and absorption chillers, so utilizing those specifically on site at the individual customers, and then a more broadly, uh, a decentralized heating system uh, whereby we can utilize uh, both the heat electricity and also particularly in the applications of food processing for thermal chilling uh, for those uh, refrigerator requirements. A key to the project is around creating an infrastructure that allows for the distribution of that energy created locally. Um, a key focus at the moment is around a high voltage network, a, a small microgrid that interconnects those key industrial parties and how they can receive directly that energy produced from the CHP component. We're also looking and have interrogated to utilize the local ga gas network uh, for a regional town. Cara has a local network. Uh, I think uh, one of the parties afterwards, we were talking specifically to that, but looking at how effectively we can provide that uh, biomethane or converting it to an upgraded uh, renewable natural gas and servicing the network through that provision. Uh, then also looking at a decentralized thermal network. So uh, capturing some of the waste heat and hate, uh, waste production through the pyrolysis process and distributing back directly to customers. Uh, future opportunities around SMR uh, in terms of creating our renewable gases through a hydrogen pathway. Um, a key part of this project is around optimizing those resources that we create. So obviously through a biogeneric uh, uh, renewable generation, uh, our key focus is around the renewable natural gas, but also there's four other components that play a key sector in terms of actually the, the business case for the project. Uh, the utilization of the renewable heat, um, both high grade and also the residual waste heat coming from a number of the processes as well. Also a key focus and, and a big consideration for the project is also the utilization of other byproducts, uh, the CO2 applications specifically for intensive horticulture. In most regional settings, uh, intensive horticulture utilizes the burning of LPG for those applications. So a real key opportunity there in terms of agricultural production. And then also utilizing both the biodigestate from the AD process and char from the pyrolysis applications 
and how they can potentially be used for nutrient up upgrading and applications back to agriculture. So multiple interfaces, and I guess it's a quite an iterative process in terms of exploring the opportunities, understanding the customer demand and requirements, and then res and, and reshaping the project around that. One of the key projects, as mentioned before, is the Cara Microgrid project. So this looks at a local distribution network, and we're currently undertaking a detailed feasibility for an embedded network. What that allows for is for a high voltage connection. Uh, currently, all the customers are serviced by a low voltage um, provision. Uh, by placing them behind uh, a mother meter, for want of a better word, we're allowed to distribute that e the, any generated energy, so behind the meter generation directly to those customers. And that sort of changes the whole model and dynamic of how we can uh, compete in the wholesale market by di directly providing to those customers. It reduces uh, both their connection charges by shared HP connection, but also reduces their tariffs in terms of their current um, charges. Uh, this is currently funded by the federal government through the Re Remote and Regional Community Energy Fund, and I guess also uh, provides an ideal application for the utilization of um, CHP through a biogas channel and how they can be utilized. Uh, we've identified a small um, solar component and storage component to uh, demonstrate that capacity. But I guess the key focus is around uh, biogas and its application in, in a microgrid. Over years, we've been developing the Cara Energy Center, uh, what we describe broadly as this agri-industry precinct, where it's co-located with a number of key ind industrial parties and also uh, local government facilities as well. Uh, we enacted a six-slot subdivision uh, that's um, seeking to uh, engage uh, with um, different in industries to relocate to that particular location, whereby uh, there are a number of resource inputs coming from those industrial pr uh, processes, and then how we can actually convert that and produce um, a number of outputs which we can then distribute locally. As a key focus at the moment, we're um, looking at a pilot scale project uh, whereby we're servicing one of the or two of the key customers, um, they are a waste provider. So we co we're we co-locating the uh, infrastructure uh, adjacent to the existing waste stream, and thereby we can also process the, uh, the, um, the biogas up, uh, converted to um, both electrical and thermal utilization, and then directly distribute it back through the microgrid and a thermal network to those customers. So this is currently um, our key focus, running in parallel with the, the, the CARA microgrid. And um, we hope to have this sort of up and happening within the next 12 months. Concurrently, uh, over the years, we um, even identified in a small setting like CARA that you can potentially have a number of nodes within, this, within one, one um, township setting. Uh, we identified that the um, meat processes of the abattoir Obviously, having a significant waste resource was an opportunity to potentially allow for a co-digestion process, obviously increasing the gas make through that production. Unfortunately, whilst we scoped and identified this project, um, it was difficult to get that over the line in terms of this co-digestion aspect. And so we uh, introduced the, um, the owner of the facility to Martin Energy Group. They are a provider of um, bioenergy technology uh, they were originally um, uh, started off in the States as RCM digesters, as most people in the bioenergy sector may, may know them previously. And they've currently just um, implemented a 25 megawatt um, anaerobic lagoon, uh, repurposing the existing wastewater treatment ponds, and then looking to provide a CHP implementation whereby they sell the energy back directly to, um, to the abattoir itself. Uh, they're running this concurrently with sustainable energy design and we, I guess, stepped away from this project, introducing the client to the, to the um, technology providers. But it's great to see a project like this up and happening in CARA now. Uh, currently, as I said, under commissioning, I think they produced their first gas going back a couple of weeks, which is great to see. So what are some of the benefits coming out of these projects? Um, I guess from a clean perspective, looking at it from a triple bottom line, uh, particularly for a number of these large industrial customers, um, looking at providing renewable generation through energy um, and very much focused on meeting local demand, not, not necessarily um, feeding back into the wholesale network. Um, significant emissions abatement, we've currently just undertaken uh, as, as part of the network, uh, sorry, the net zero studies uh, with the support of sustainability advantage where we've understood and 
looked at the emissions abatement coming from these respective industries and what is it starting to shape is that the clean energy generation coming from the clean car project can significantly contribute to emissions abatement, uh, both from the biomass conversion for clean energy generation, but also around the uh, waste management uh, component wh whereby we're reducing uh, methane um, sequestration. Employment, obviously significant and really important for a regional sector. Uh, the nature of uh, bioenergy projects is that it's quite diverse sectors that it benefits, uh, both from the resource recovery aspect, but also through to clean energy generation and also then subsequent bioproducts uh, through processing. So in this particular instance, uh, upgrading of digestates, uh, potentially producing uh, ag agricultural um, alternatives. And then obviously for a small town, the flow and effects and through employment and growth, and then uh, in, in a sense, uh, creating uh, enabling infrastructure that effectively d develops a local circular economy and those on flowing on impacts. For the um, industry parties themselves, uh, the nature of um, this co-location by creating a precinct, uh, there's an opportunity to substitute the energy resources also utilizing uh, generation from these local distributed resources, as well as also providing a waste management opportunity um, whereby we can reprocess that waste and then provide energy back to those customers. And in, in effect, also looking how we can provide uh, replacing inputs such as uh, bio-based fertilizers um, by producing those byproducts. Um, most critically, also uh, offering up an energy reliability uh, diversifying their energy resources. So a lot of these customers, as has been mentioned before, thermal component is a significant component to their energy demand. And we also have an opportunity to respond to some of their peak demand responses. So by having four customers, you have this ability to, I guess, balance the cycles to some degree and then provide an energy response to that requirement. Uh, key consideration in regional settings as well is outages that do occur, uh, frequencies, of um, significant storms and outages that we have the ability to run supply during those outages, uh, particularly for some of the crucial infrastructure such as um, galvanizing plants or food processing where there could be a loss of product. Key aspect is around the collaboration. So it's very much a collaborative project, working very closely with these parties and understanding and I guess building trust in terms of what we're offering in terms of the broader project as well as providing um, some uh, cost uh, benefits and cost savings through um, processing their waste and then also the offerings and the alternative uh, energy resources that reduce their operational costs. In terms of long-term uh, long sustainability, uh, looking at it from a, both an environmental but also a social and economic uh, out outcome for the community itself. And this is very much um, around producing local markets um, or creating local markets for local produce uh, and how that in fact um, benefits the township and, and, and the industries themselves. And this project, um, I guess, is very much uh, scalable within the Cowra's um, locality itself, but also scalable within the regions and what this may look like. And this last slide, I've, I've just indicated that um, obviously these are complex projects, but they also have a number of touch points with a number of key parties. And these are the number of government agencies all working in the bioenergy space. So right through from clean energy, right through to you know responsible consumption and growth, um, a lot of the work that's been done around the net zero plan. And also more recently, uh, New South Wales Circular with um, their infrastructure and precincts uh, projects that they're exploring at the moment. So um, I think this sort of gives an overview of the project and some of the opportunities arising from it. Uh, it's, I've given you sort of a broader overview of the project and the potentially benefits to industry and agriculture, uh, but I think I'm um, happy to take more detailed questions. Thanks, Dylan. Much appreciated, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, uh, we've, we do have about uh, 20 minutes now for questions, so uh, I might lead off with a couple. There are some in the Q&A and the messages that I'll call out as well, and, and feel free to add others to the chat function uh, if you have them in the audience. Um, Dylan, I might start with you. Uh, obviously, it's been a, a, a journey uh, in, in both time and effort and a fantastic journey in what you've achieved. How has uh, sort of council, community, industry, government, um, you know, support and perception for the project changed or evolved over time? Uh, you know, when you talk about a bioenergy precinct, did it 
you know, at first was it, what is that? Uh, it, but, you know, how has it evolved over the course of the project? Yeah, so, I mean, some of the project development goes back as far as uh, 2014, even 13, when we did our initial uh, biomass audit. Um, that was supported through uh, the Sustainability Advantage Program, whereby they provided some support to undertake some of this initial uh, exploration. Um, we also, through that, got further engagement with local local government and council. Uh, it was a, you know, a very iterative process explaining the, the potential benefits, what bioenergy meant from a regional perspective, and I guess also just getting councillors engaged and comfortable with what it meant. They provided some initial support to the project. Um, we also even interrogated a, a potential um, application where we could cover one of the um, uh, their um, well, lagoons at the wastewater treatment plant. So that was back in, I think, 2016, where we interrogated that. Actually, where our initial introduction to RCM digesters occurred. Um, unfortunately, we you know, stumbled across a public-private partnership provision, which uh, council wasn't comfortable with. Uh, but it gave us a lot of good knowledge in terms of the opportunity. And lo and behold, uh, I believe Sydney Water and Gemina <laughs> going down this exact path, you know, in terms of actually utilising wastewater as a potential local resource. And what we were offering up is a, is a co-digestion, introducing additional substrates to improve the gas make for that project. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Dom, a quick question for you. Do you, do you earn um, carbon credits or accus at all for the replacement of LPG uh, with, with biomass from your project or does it predate the scheme? No, no, we don't access any, any of that. Savings are purely in um, in fuel cost savings. Yeah. Um, Nick, uh, I guess there's been a couple of comments about uh, you know dollars per gigajoule costs through the course of the presentations. Um, are you able to give any sort of feel from a capex perspective? Uh, you know, for either one of your projects, perhaps particularly the new install. Um, you know, yeah. Any sort of feel for capex levels. It's um, obviously dependent on, on a lot of factors, um, how complex the, the equipment needs to be in terms of emission control, how, how good a fuel you've got or how bad a fuel you've got, um, and the scope uh, in terms of civils, boiler house, um, whether it's a boiler island or you're doing a lot of um, integrating pipe work as well. But, but a sort of rule of thumb as a, as a guide is sort of three quarters of a million to a million dollars per megawatt installed. Um, megawatt so this, thermal, I assume. Yeah, per megawatt thermal. So that's typically for, for the sort of larger boiler plant, the, the more complex sort of plants we tend to do. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Dom, we've got a question uh, from an attendee. Is Meredith interested in carbon farming practices? Uh, when you say carbon farming practices, are, are we interested in the practices in terms of learning what's out there or, or in terms of accessing markets? Uh, Peter, if you're still there, you're welcome to come off mute and uh, articulate further, but if not, well, you might be. Sure, oh, actually, uh, I'm on. What I meant was in terms of farming practices to sequester carbon. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of th the uh, sustainability projects you're looking at and the potential for uh, chipping on site and logging. I know there's uh, certain outfits like Elders, for example, that are trying to promote uh, carbon farming uh, amongst uh, you know, operators in Victoria and other places. I was interested yeah. if that was something you're looking at. Yeah, sure. So, so um, the short answer is is yes. Um, so, so I mentioned a colleague of mine, um, another environmental coordinator. He's got a background in soil science. Um, so I guess broadly, uh, there's an interest in increasing soil carbon, um, and I guess a lot, a lot of the sort of discussion around, you know, regen ag or, or whatever term you want to use, is, is around, you know, maintaining some ground cover, um, rotational grazing, uh, soil amendments. Uh, so you know, we we spread all the manure. Um, it's all direct drill. Like that, um, there's a lot of processes. Um, that are generally already in place um, aimed at sort of maintaining soil health and soil carbon. Um, and, you know, I'd be happy to have any, hear any further suggestions around that. 
Um, in terms of accessing markets, uh, we have been very interested, as in, as in not only building that carbon, but sort of um, getting some sort of financial return from it. Um, there has been some interest in that. Um, essentially, it, it has proven quite hard to find somebody who is willing to sort of work at the sort of scale that we're at um, and give sort of firm metrics. And, and it's just a pathway we haven't really pursued um, as yet. I think a, uh, you know, perhaps a, a general comment for all project developers, you know, if you, if you watch carbon prices at all, they've you know, gone from about $15 to $40 for an ACU in the last 12 months. And I think the Euro European carbon price is now above us $100 Australian. Um, so uh, certainly registering projects, uh, if there is a methodology under the ERF, is something to look at early because, uh, you know, the, the returns that are available there have changed a lot in the last 12 months. Um, a follow-on question for Dylan. Uh, looking back on the process, what support would have helped to remove barriers, you know, support from local council or state government, for example? Uh, there was probably early support, as I indicated earlier. Uh, probably it's at this later iteration where there's a lot of groundwork that's been covered off on where you sort of need to bring into investment readiness. So it's probably that later uh, business development funding or support, which is probably um what we're interrogating at the moment so obviously there's a lot of interest in terms of investing in these projects but getting it from where it is now to to investment readiness is probably the key key component yep thank you um and uh, you know unfortunately i think that is a bit of a common theme in the australian market is is development capital uh it's, it is a key challenge uh for for project developers um dom my question uh have you estimated how much of your emissions come from animals? Um, any initiative on using alternative feeds? Any initiative on producing your own biomass for the boilers? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so, yes, we have some figures. I don't have them on hand around um, ruminant emissions. Uh, and that is tied up with uh, also a sort of all of company emissions, so fuel, electricity, um, although we do purchase LGCs, um, gas, and um, even even our sort of cropping emissions. Um, we have done a bit of work around um, probably trying to understand better the short short um, carbon cycle compared to sort of longer term carbon cycle. Um, there are sort of that, those two key methodologies around carbon accounting, um, which is GWP 100 and GWP P star, or at least they're the two I'm familiar with. Um, so we're probably trying to understand, I guess, how, uh, how what, it, what is the best way to actually um, monitor what impact the incre the step change increase in in number of ruminants on the property compared to a step change increase in the amount of property which has increased soil carbon or um, or trees planted out that didn't previously um, so that's something which my colleagues doing a lot of work on um, in terms of sorry and, and just on that I think I guess broadly my opinion is that um, Although ruminant emissions and farming emissions do pose a challenge, um, particularly in the short term for atmospheric carbon, um, I'm I'm probably personally of the personally of the opinion that burning of fossil fuel fuels is a much longer term irreparable um, impact that we can have. Um, so that that is, I guess, why I'm so keen to pursue bioenergy. Um, in terms of Alternative feeds, yeah, there's um, SNOP, I think, and there's a few sort of, you know, oil supplements, um, and we're following that pretty closely. I think we're going to try and do a trial sort of as soon as that um, SNOP becomes commercially available. Um, any initiative on producing your own biomass for the boilers? Uh, yeah, so like I said, we're already chipping on site um, to give an idea of whether we would do it um, at the moment the recycled timber is really it either has 
no market or not much market, or it's used for mulch, um, where it'll sort of oxidize and return to CO2. So we're intercepting that process and extracting energy in the, in the short term. Um, if that became um, not possible because bioenergy took off, we would have ability um, to generate on site. Uh, we're using two tonnes per day, uh, so that's 700 tonnes odd per year. I think they talk about maybe, you know, pretty conservative figure is six to seven tonnes per hectare per year. So we'd be talking about 100 hectares planted out, continually being harvested if we wanted to do it on site. Um, and we already have probably 250 hectares planted out. So um, it is a potential um, sort of real circular economy story, but the logistics that it... Um, that it challenges are not something to sort of undertake without planning it out. Thanks, thanks, Dom. Um, and and you know, for those interested, the Meat and Livestock Australia, the Red Meat Association, has a target of carbon neutral twenty thirty. Um, and so, if you're interested in uh, you know animal emissions and feeds, uh, it's worth looking into that as well as soil carbon and the other solutions for that industry to get there. Um, Nick, a question, how much thermal energy storage uh, can the Energy Nest technology provide? Yeah, this, this is um, quite an exciting new technology. So the, they come they're highly modul modularised. Uh, they come in 20-foot container sized. Uh, they're essentially concrete um, cylinders that, that have pressure pipes within them. Um, so the, 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 the thermal heating mechanism goes through the, through the pipe encased in a, in a big... Um, concrete tube so they're about two megawatts per module um, but it depends it's up and down a bit depending on what your um, charge temperature is and what your discharge temperature is so there's got to be a little bit of, uh, of a driver a slightly higher charging temperature than the discharge um, but yeah so the smallest would be two two megawatts thermal and they can modulize up to they've looked at some large utility power stations in in japan that are 200 megawatts of, of thermal storage so um, they are easily scalable. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. Um, Dylan, another question. Uh, does a bioenergy precinct have a minimum size from either an input perspective or output, or can any size precinct potentially be viable? I would say initially probably there's certain economies of scale in terms of what you're trying to achieve because of all the associated infrastructure so apart from the facility if you only have say one one off take it's a very different logistic as you're providing a whole lot of infrastructure to interconnect all those parties so there's certainly an economies of scale uh but that can largely play out depending on the co-location of those existing um industries and parties so uh it doesn't really answer the question is there a minimum size probably to some degree um but i think you can scale just mentioned before the modularity as well that you can scale these facilities as well so your initial pilot project may be a lot smaller than the initial instance uh then implementing the uh tech the um infrastructure to distribute that energy is probably the key the key question probably around that and we're currently doing quite a lot of work on that in relation to a the the microgrid component but also looking at uh, local gas networks as well thanks dylan um we're almost out of time. I mean, I'm, I might just uh, pose one general question to each of the speakers to, to wrap up. Uh, you know, we, we saw in the bioenergy roadmap that you know, industrial heat from bioenergy could potentially double, uh, you know, between now and, and 2030. Um, we've also seen that, you know, the economics and, and from Dom's presentation and others uh, can be very good and much better than fossil fuels. Um, uh, you know, at least on an operational basis, noting that the capex can sometimes be higher for for bioenergy projects. Um, you know, a, a question to the three speakers, perhaps in order. So, starting with Nick, uh, you know, as a country, how do we unlock more bioenergy industrial heat projects? Uh, you know, is is there a single key thing we can do, uh, or what are your views on on how we move this sector forward quickly? Yeah, I think um, following the lead of what New Zealand have done would would really kickstart it. So, so they've. I don't know what the actual driver is, but they mandated um, natural gas, um, no more natural gas plants. So it's forcing everybody's hand to either go um, to electric boilers or, or to biomass, essentially. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be a big driver. Here at the moment, gas is still cheap. Um, the capital cost of the, of the 
a biomass boiler is probably four times that of a natural gas. So it's, again, cost cost is the big hurdle at the moment. At least from a, from a CapEx perspective. Correct. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and certainly, uh, you know, we hit a lot of manufacturers that we see, um, you know, often run a two to three year payback requirement. Mm -hmm. um, so unless they treat major infrastructure investment as a separate bucket and assess it on more of an IRR basis, um, you know, that, that can still be a barrier, even though, you know, with Dom's example, the actual operational cost can be can be quite a bit lower. Um, Correct. Dom, uh, do you have a particular view on, on how as, a, as an industry we unlock more uh, sort of renewable heat projects? I mean, I mean, even just as a sub question to that, uh, you know, the dairies in your area or your region, are they all on biomass or are they still running LPG? And, and if so, why haven't they done what you've done? Um, oh, there's a, there's a bit in that. Um, I, I think broadly there's just hesitation around the technology. So, you know, there's there's a few sort of notable projects in the region that have been, um, you know, there's one one AD project that's been operating for 30 plus years um, and there's another one that's sort of been almost ready to commercialise for a few years now and and I, I'm not sure that it's a great deal closer. Um, so there's a, there's, there's a lot of hesitation. Um, there seems to be a lot of people, anytime I do something like this or, or sort of speak um, speak with others, I, I get a lot of people calling me, um, you know, offering products and and a lot of them never come through. So I think there's real hesitation and it's it's, I don't know how you overcome that other than just one project at a time. Um, for us who, I guess, the, the, the um, hesitancy around risk isn't so much there, what, what's holding us back or what has um, sort of posed the greatest risk um, once we decided that we wanted to go that way is, is, um, is fuel markets. Um, so, you know, we have or we had huge headaches around, you know, consistent clean fuel of a certain quality Um and it's really, you know, you, you really hinge on a, on a very small number of suppliers. So I, th I think it's a sort of chicken and egg thing. Um, we just need to get one up and then another one up. Yep. So I guess more, more good, successful projects and supply chains by the sound of it. Um, yep. Dylan, any uh, sort of comments from your perspective? Yeah, yeah, probably two. I mean, one, as you pointed out in your introduction, was just acknowledging the, the demand for thermal energy you know there's a lot of focus on electrification but for many of these large industrial parties that that's a long way off i mean particularly if you think around in the steel or steel fabrication industry you know electric furnaces are yes uh are available but either very high in capex when you're competing with a very low low grade cost for for thermal gas basically so then it comes back to the question well if you are producing a renewable natural gas it's probably around actually providing that distribution infrastructure so that if you do have a, a resource, you ha have the ability to ship it directly to parties. So whether that's through the existing networks or, or newly defined networks is, is probably probably my second part of the answer. Thanks, Dylan. And, and I guess on that point, thank you very much to our three presenters today uh, for taking the time out. Um, obviously a, a, a different format, uh, but one we've all got a bit more used to electronically or virtually over the last couple of years. So um, it does now allow us to connect. I think we've had had a number of people uh, videoing in from, from around the world. So uh, thank you again to our speakers. Uh, and on that note, uh, we will break from this session uh, and the next session kicks off in half an hour. So thank you very much.